Joel, what is it like, you know, doing all the filming process and then finally seeing the finished product for the first time? Because it has to be almost overwhelming. Yeah, well, you know, we're a big family, so we don't, we see iterations of it along the way. Um, the first iterations you're seeing is actually when, when you're shooting, right? So when we're in the performance capture world, there are, this is kind of weird to explain, but there are cameras outside of the performance capture stage to which you can look and see your own Navi or avatar, in my case, avatar, uh, on that screen. And Jim Cameron has a virtual camera with a sort of a big ball in the front of it. And the, and, and the tech side is telling it that that's a camera. So he, if he points that at me, he sees my avatar. Or if he points it at Zoe, he sees Zoe's Navi and he sees the entire world around us. So we have, we experience this. I liken it to sort of like in the first one, it was a, a, a bit different, you know, but this one, there were better graphics, but it's almost like you're looking at the Xbox version and then it iterates from there and become, and as it's getting rendered, you're seeing the, the 1920 by by 1080 version and then you're seeing the 2k and then you're seeing the 4k so when the render process happens the render process is obviously you know the, one of the longest processes uh in on the post-production side of it um but you're so you know we get we get the feeling from early stages and then it all come almost like comes into focus as it renders out so i was able to see about 45 minutes of rendered uh footage before the premieres uh and i was as blown away as anyone was you know that the even just seeing you don't notice it as much but if you looked at the first avatar and the second avatar side by side the richness and texture the um the ability to um to differentiate differentiate every single pixel on screen and the background and every avatar you know the movement of every avatar even in the far 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 background is visually so perfect like you've never seen anything like the amount of information that is in every frame of avatar and some of this goes not unnoticed, but some it's hard for an audience to kind of take it all in because it's a, such a visual masterpiece, it's a thrill ride. But like, if you go back and watch it, you go back and watch the first one and look at the deep, deep background. It's awesome. It's the best at that time. But if you watch the deep, deep background, every leaf, every tiny little avatar and frame, it's just perfect. It's really spectacular. Yeah, I think that's why we're seeing so many repeat viewings as well. And it has to be just... You know, since you are a director yourself, it has to be so such a great learning experience seeing how James Cameron operates. Uh, you know, obviously you're not filming at the same scale nobody is as James Cameron with his huge blockbusters. But but how has it been just kind of getting to see him work and his style firsthand? And how has that kind of helped yourself um, with your movies? Well, as big as these movies are, they are when you're on set, you're almost, it's almost like you're back to black box theater on the, on the performance capture side. There's a big gray stage. You have to imagine what's around you. You have cameras, you have cameras that are virtually showing you what is around you. Of course, Jim carries a camera that's a virtual camera um, that's speaking to the infrared cameras um, above you and then the technology side. So he can see us, he can see our avatars or in Zoe's case or sam's case they're navis uh, he can see every tree and every and where the sun is and so he can essentially film the entire thing and capture what he wants to see through it all and we're seeing different iterations uh, of that as it's advancing into into the sort of um into the render side so i think that what what we what we gain from it is all of the all of the experience of shooting in that space but what we're actually in is kind of like a little theater group it's like a little theater troupe that's coming and having to fig and having to imagine everything a around them as they're uh performing so it really does i'm not i'm not saying that it's the same as a small budget film but i'm saying that jim approaches the directing side of it very intimately uh as you would see on a smaller budget film as well that's incredible. And, and, you know, there's a time jump in Avatar too, and 
Norm's not as directly involved this time, but you still see that he has this very deep connection with Jake Sully. When things go wrong, you're the first person he calls. What do you like most about just seeing that friendship and how it's kind of, you know, morphed but still stayed strong over the years? Well, that's exactly right. And, you know, of course, there's there's three more. Um, there's a lot of story uh, in front of us, so that friendship stays strong through it. But I think that you're right. You know, the 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 relationship that Sam and I first when we started, it was very contentious. Um, and and we grew into knowing through survival and understanding what we our our passion and our dedication to the planet of Pandora. Um, I think that we we really realize that there's just a deep bond um, and and the sacrifice that we both made. Obviously, his was a physical sacrifice moving from literally from body to body, becoming a Navi. Um, and mine is the sacrifice of not leaving with everyone at the end of the first uh, one, deciding to stay on the planet, deciding to continue the Avatar program. Really, my character is kind of the, uh, the, the, the last stand of the Avatar program. Everyone else has moved on over into the Navi side, um, including Sigourney Weaver's character coming coming back as Kiri, so which is the, I think the the, the most phenomenal uh, uh, story path um, uh, in this in the of course the sequel and then ahead of us in the in the franchise it's a really it's really amazing you know just the ability for her to come back as this character um, you know as a teeny as a teen uh, you know to to be able to just act that is really phenomenal. So yeah, the family her that was energy is just incredible. The youthful, I know it was so fun to see on set. You know, her to sort of her t t turn into a kid. You know, but the, I I would say that Kitty also is a wise teen. She's a wise child, right? She's not really your average child. There is obviously something about her that will that it was discovered in the sequel and then will continue to be discovered in the future of this franchise. Um, that is so profound and so. Um, connected to the resource of Ewa and the identity of Ewa and the and the um, uh, intercommunication of the plants and animals uh, on Pandora that I think you know it just it just gives such a phenomenal look to the character development that she has had from the first two uh, to the rest of this franchise. And then, uh, you know, going back to the original film, I was curious because I was looking into some deleted scenes. I saw there was a whole romance subplot between Norm and Trudy that yeah. had some scenes filmed and were cut. Um, what were your thoughts when you saw that didn't make the uh, the final cut? I was very happy because that had that every movie that you make, you cut. Right. So like there, there as an as a director, I've learned this. I directed my first feature at 25, 26. So I think it was a really good lesson on uh, not being offended when things were cut on on the acting side of things. Uh, but you have to approach and edit story first. Of course, you want to make sure that the action sequences are correct and the characters are well evaluated. But you have to say you have to look at a whole you have to take a holistic view of your entire sort of 30,000 foot view and say, what drives my story the best? So an audience is satiated at the end of this movie. And I, I at every moment that Michelle and I worked together, we became good friends. Um, and every moment that we that we had, uh, uh, you know, from New Zealand, from hanging out and partying in New Zealand, all the way to our onset work was so wonderful and so precious but unnecessary for that story. The story was about our relationship with the Navi and how we were going to assimilate into their, into their society and to their culture and learn from them and adapt to the behaviors uh, that the Navi had and learn how to survive and to then fend off uh, the traditional bad guys who were then going to attack their way of life. And I think that, again, you're seeing this sort of cyclical story line in the sequel as well. Why is that important? Because I think that what Jim is trying to do is teach a lesson about what we are dealing with here on planet Earth. And it's not about bad guys and good guys. It's about how do we protect uh, the most fundamental and the most precious parts of our um of, the, of of our society and that is the earth that we stand on and the, you know we have a it's, it's funny i have a my head of production at my company has a, a saying on the wall it says you can't make movies on a dead planet 
And I always think about that. Every time that I, every time that we're frustrated or whatever we're doing in life, I'm like, this is the most important thing. You know, I'm going to a climate summit uh, for a couple of weeks in Antarctica. And it's all about how to, how to figure out how to promote more action on, on this planet. And Jim is doing that by allowing for us to see repercussions on another planet and how that affects, how that's a mirror to what we're dealing with on a daily basis in the, on, on planet Earth. Yeah, that's so well put and a beautiful reminder. And before we wrap, I did want to ask you, um, one of my favorite films of yours is Grandma's Boy and you as ah. JP is just so hilarious. How was it just fully committing to that character? And has it really surprised you that, you know, so many years later, almost like 20 years, people are still loving that movie and it still crazy. You know, has that fan base? Well, Nick Swordson uh, is a legend. He is brilliant. Um, he's one of my favorite guys that I've met in uh, in Los Angeles. Um, he created something I think is that that could stand the test of time just because it's a fun, iconic, um, classic kind of comedy that, that we don't even really make comedies like that anymore. Goofball or, 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 or whatever you would call Grandma's Boy, whatever that kind of hybrid comedy is, um, you don't see a lot of them. It failed in the theater. It made maybe two and a half million dollars in the theater, went out on 2,500 screens or something. So massive failure. And then it killed it on DVD. It was like the perfect momentum coming from a kind of a failed theatrical release into everybody just wanting to see this weird movie. Uh, I think it hit the college campuses in a really big way. But because of that, on a daily basis, I hear from people on uh, uh, about Grandma's Boy, this sort of movie that we never knew was going to have this kind of life. Um, so uh, I think it's, you know, counted as one of our cult classics in the in the comedy space and uh we're all proud of it it's fun you know uh, nick goosen did an incredible job directing it it's another good friend of mine and i think that we can all sort of just like we I, it gives us giggles that it that you know almost what 18 17 years later um it's you know i'll we'll be walking around at a mall and somebody will come up and talk to me about grandma's boy <laughs> it's crazy